Good morning. Good to see all of you. Um, we think this is a, a, a great opportunity uh, for Nebraska. Uh, uh, sorry for those of you from out of state that will be a little parochial, but so be it, right? <laughs> we know who pays our salaries, right? That's fairly <laughs> straightforward. Um, so situation. Uh, that may be embellished a little, but a couple million cows uh, and about two and a half million on feed continuously. Uh, the estimate I saw was about 10.3 million acres of corn to be planted this year. Uh, 6.3 uh, irrigated and four of dry land. Kind of sets our situation. Uh, now the change that's taken place. I don't know how many times I've said that. I, I, I've been in Nebraska for, uh, it'll be 47 years I think on uh, Friday, okay? Um, and easily the impact of the ethanol industry is, is bigger than anything else. Would you agree with that? It's just impact, it's, it's what's the effect on corn price, why we're here today, right, is because of the ethanol industry. Um, and it's, it's got these challenges, right? Uh, uh, Steve, we're, if all, is it 24 if they're operating? 25. 25 if they're all operating. Um, uh, and number two state, estimate is about 35% of the uh, corn in the state is going into uh, ethanol. Uh, obviously that has impacted corn price. Uh, do you remember this? Right, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, and uh, when I made the slide, the 650 maybe sounded a little high, but uh, after the last couple of days, actually, uh, uh, Greg, that's what you were saying. You can get that for the corn now, can't you? Yeah, because of the basis. Um, now, the other part of it's the byproducts. And you know, the interesting thing is with all of this discussion today about uh, use of the residues, the byproducts is a tremendous key to this. That's what makes it work is because we have the byproducts available, I believe. So the challenge is corn price. Remember, for 50 years we had cheap corn and so uh, I wrote an article for an international uh, journal, and they preferred that I not use the word cheap. It's one of my favorite words, quite frankly. The students all know this, that I'm kind of cheap, and I like the word cheap. It, I meant to use the word cheap, right? We had cheap corn. They said I should use inexpensive, so I changed it. But it was cheap corn, right? Um, now, We've got pasture conversion to corn. Every time, I, don't, I haven't seen specific figures, but uh, every time I bring it up, people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's uh, acres, uh, Don, I think you mentioned this, acres that you saw in your home uh, county being uh, plowed up that should probably not have been plowed up. Uh, I noticed in yesterday's Lincoln Journal Star that uh, uh, the bids in for uh, CRP were down considerably. People are plowing up uh, CRP land. Now that may not, may or may not uh, uh, reduce our supply of forages, right? It depends on whether we, we're going to let us hay the, uh, 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 the CRP land. But the point is we've got a, uh, uh, a supply and price issue on forages, don't we? Now. When, when Galen and I started talking about this back in, what, January, February, we knew it was going to be dry and we'd have a drought, right? That was a joke. You were supposed to kind of chuckle at that. Uh, pardon? It, well, that's true. It was dry at that time, too. We thought maybe it would rain, though. But anyway, uh, so what do we have? Steve did a nice job of illustrating the abundance of corn residue, right? All of this has caused corn to increase. Corn, and so it's, it's acres of corn, 
and it's the yield in that pretty much constant ratio of residue to grain, so we just keep producing more and, and more corn, uh, more and more uh, corn residue. So that's uh, uh, the challenge. In terms of uh, amount of residue, uh, uh, Steve had the uh, national value, but for Nebraska, our 10.3 million acres, uh, again, the 6.3 of irrigated and 4 of dry land. Uh, the last couple of years suggest that we might have 170 bushel corn in Nebraska uh, this year. So uh, that figures out to be about, based on, on that relation, the long-term relationship between dry land and irrigated, of about 200 on irrigated and 122 on dry land. Um, I estimate, which is close to what Steve showed, 80% of grain as the amount of, of uh, uh, dry residue. In other words, if you've got 100 pounds of uh, dr uh, dry corn grain, you're going to have 80 pounds of residue to go with that, right? Okay. Now, I'll probably forget it if I don't discuss it now. Um, I think we've we've gone for years talking about a 50-50 ratio, and I think that is fairly close. Uh, uh, Dirk's going to disagree with that slightly, but it's fairly close at corn silage harvest. By the time we're harvesting dry residue, we've lost soluble material out of the stalk. That's why the stalk that, that Steve was talking about is really good quality uh, when you harvest it wet because that black layer formation in the corn, when it's completed putting starch into the kernel, there's still sugar in the stem that's been photosynthesized, and, and that photosynthesis may continue for a little while as long as that leaf is green. That's stored in the stem, and so that moisture that you may not, I mean, that's where the moisture problem is. The leaves and husks are pretty dry at baling, right? It's in that stem that you got the moisture, and that sugar is in as well. That sugar then may get metabolized and, uh, and Tom Hogemeyer, our, our, our uh, uh, corn geneticist, uh, I mean the Hogemeyer hybrids, Tom Hogemeyer, tells us that Tom's not here, is he today? Um, I don't want to say anything bad about him if he's here. See, that's what I'm, uh, He says probably a lot of fun, fungal growth and so on on that stalk that's metabolizing that sugar. So think about this now when uh, uh, Dirk and Gaylor are talking about silage, uh, we're losing 15 to 20 percent of that material uh, uh, as sugar that's being metabolized out of there and just going off as uh, CO2. Um, so by loss of that sugar, we've decreased the proportion of grain to residue by the time we get to residue compared to what it is at corn silage harvest. Um, <laughs> So that comes out to be uh, 4.8 tons uh, per acre of irrigated ground, and I think that was really close to what Steve was showing, so we're being pretty consistent, and uh, about 2.93. Uh, I carried that to two decimal places. A couple of you have heard me say this before uh, to make it sound like I really knew what I was doing, but it's obviously an estimate, so it just sounds like I know what I'm doing. Ken Vogel put this slide together, kind of illustrates this situation we're in. Um, uh, the cattle, uh, cattle on grass. Uh, uh, we can't stretch the sand hills, right? We won't make any more sand hills. We can manage that, we can always manage it a little bit better, can't we? Can't make it rain in the sand hills. Uh, so we can't produce much for, more forage that way. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, the, the corn grain, it's ill uh, and feedlots, whole issue. Uh, it's a nice diagram. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about grain. Uh, it may be the best use of a residue. We've been using it that way for a long time. Um, uh, Rasby's uh, data, he did a five, 
year summary of grazing. Uh, and this is just showing uh, 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 supplementation versus unsupplemented. Um, and the, the point is not so much that. I'm just, I think you all know this. We can run cows on corn stalks over the winter months and, uh, and maintain them in, in pretty good condition. Um, you can see that um, uh, supplementation had a, only a small effect, uh, a little bit of effect on uh, uh, body condition score coming off, and uh, uh, not much effect on uh, weight. Uh, didn't affect uh, subsequent uh, uh, pregnancy rates or weaning weight. But I'm not here to talk about the supplement. I'm talking about cows grazing corn stalks with no supplement. Uh, uh, maintain weight and reproductive efficiency, et cetera, right? So this is a great opportunity for us to, to utilize the residue. Um, this is work with uh, growing calves. Uh, I, again, I've told this story. My neighbor about two miles from me uh, had some uh, cows and my sons worked for him uh, when they were in high school and growing up. And he said, Terry, he said, uh, I, know, I know you're a professor and all, and you're probably fairly smart. He, I might have fooled him on that, but that's beside the point. But he said, uh, I'm not sure about that research, putting those calves out on stalks. That's, stalks are for cows, not for calves. And then he, well, uh, he's, he was a good guy, but uh, he was wrong. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, these, the reason got all those dots, looks like a lot of observations, they were individually supplemented, okay? So we've got our individual feeding barn and we've got uh, uh, corn fields next to us so they could graze during the day, come in in the morning and get their supplement, okay? So with calves at a little over a pound and a half a day uh, of protein, uh, as distiller's grains, uh, we could get them to gain around the pound a day. And then the more distillers you feed, the faster they gain. That's not rocket science. Uh, DJ, uh, I assume, is here. Is he? Okay. Uh, I, I prefer to show somebody else's research rather than yours with gluten feed. I just thought this was more reliable. But... Uh, <laughs> Same thing with, uh, with gluten feed that DJ did when he was a graduate student. So it uh, works very well with the calves. Uh, and I'll talk about this field a little bit later. Uh, I was out in April in this uh, field that, that uh, we've used for grazing for about 20 years. And uh, this is the ungrazed area. Uh, That was grazed in the fall. What's the big difference you notice in those? The husks are gone, thank you, right? That's the first thing they go after. And then the leaves. And then this was grazed in the spring. Now I know we had a pretty good spring, but we've been doing this for a number of years. So when I say grazed in the spring, uh, the, the calves are out there until they can go to grass about the 15th to the 20th of April. Okay, I'll come back and talk more about that. Okay, so uh, what do they eat? Uh, the husk. I've got this listed as pounds per bushel. Uh, Rick. Rick Rasby has used this very heavily, this concept. Uh, the, the thought process is that if you know how many bushels of corn was produced on a field, you can calculate how much residue is out there for the cattle to eat, right? And everybody knows what the yield was on a field of corn. So about 2.6 pounds of husk per bushel 
This is an as-is bushel, okay, a 56-pound, 15.5% moisture bushel. Uh, leaf blade, about 8.5 pounds. Leaf sheath, and we've been uh, 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 ambivalent. I'd rather use a simpler word, but that's the only one I can think of right now in terms of what we do with the leaf sheath, right? That's wrapped around the, uh, right? You got the leaf blade and you got the sheath that's wrapped around the stem. And the question is, do the cattle consume that or not? Uh, Adam, we keep looking at the fields and uh, you, you know, we, we've gotten smart uh, in the last few years, and we've gone out and we've cut the, to, to do our pre-grazing work, uh, we cut the, the stalk off before it's harvested. But I'll tell you what, when, uh, when Adam and others go out after grazing, right, that's not fun to go out there and try to figure out what's left after they graze. Inter I've got to tell you this. Interestingly, all of our work in the 80s that was done, it was done by Mexican students. It wasn't illegal immigrants doing the work. It was Mexican graduate students, and they're very, very good, okay? They were willing to go pick it up, and I appreciate their efforts. Bottom line, much better workers than I have now. And I <laughs> 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 I could help, but devil was sitting right there on my shoulder. <laughs> We're going to have to edit that. <laughs> uh, uh, about 15.3. Rick, we've been using 16 pounds. Um, uh, and so that's pretty close. Now, the estimate, and if I'm correct, the next slide. Uh, uh, shows some distribution. I'm going to get to that. Uh, about s of the of the total residue now, about 6.7 percent husk, 22 uh, percent blade, 10.8 uh, uh, sheath. That's how I'm getting to the numbers that I just showed you per bushel. About 12 percent cob, and 48.5 uh, 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 percent stem. Now, what I showed on the previous slide is what they eat. The cob and, and stem is what they don't eat, right? And that's what was left out in the field when we showed the, the, the picture. I'm not sure we saw, could see the cobs directly. Maybe I didn't look hard enough. But the stems are there, right? And this is over uh, 10 hybrids uh, uh, at, planted at four densities, about 600 plants that, that uh, Adam measured. Digestibilities of those plant parts. Adam put this together, uh, and he went back and looked at the uh, the previous research. Is this the lighter colored one? Am I right? Okay. Uh, leaf blade about 45 percent in vitro digestibilities. Uh, he this is his leaf sheath, a, a little bit less, but probably not greatly different. Uh, we didn't have that from, uh, from previous research in the 80s. And then we, we thought we would get fancy and, and, and look at that top third of the stem. Uh, you know, the, the bottom of that stem is obviously not very palatable. And if we run it through the tub grinder why, and, and treat it, we can, get them to eat, we can get them to eat it in a finishing diet with enough wet distillers around it, right? But that's not very palatable. But that upper third of the stem is, uh, is fairly fine, and we thought maybe it would have higher uh, value, so we looked at that. Uh, wrong. Another bad idea. Uh, not different than the bottom part of the stem. Okay, and there really wasn't much of it. Okay. Husk is highly digestible. That's why, uh, well, it's palatable, right? But the, the cattle aren't really dumb. Uh, that's highly digestible material, and they really go after those husks. Uh, and our digestibility seemed to be fairly similar to what it was uh, uh, back in the 80s. Uh, cob uh, is, of course, less digestible. 
the sh we got fancy on the shank as well. Uh, the shank is a connection between the stem and the ear. And we're not sure where that should go, whether it should be part of the stem or part of the husk or part of the cob, right? So we looked at that separately. Uh, it's, it's actually, what, our second most digestible material. Uh, again, uh, you haven't picked up enough shanks to know whether they eat them or not, right? Yeah. Grain available. Uh, again, when we were doing this in the 80s, uh, I think the value that we averaged was 4.2% of the grain that was produced was left in the field. And that's quite a bit of corn. Um, uh, with efficient combines, uh, all of the things that Steve talked about, uh, 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 less uh, corn borer and everything that goes along with that, right? We've got uh, uh, a much more efficient grain harvest. Uh, I, I think Rick, in that range of, uh, of uh, maybe a half a percent, but you know that's not insignificant. And so uh, I, I did the calculation that if the uh, uh, husk and leaf blade and sheath uh, were consumed and, and with a 50% harvest efficiency. This is the cattle now, harvest efficiency, at 50%. That's our estimate. Again, partially by picking up uh, a lot of material from the field uh, a after grazing. Uh, assuming 100% harvest efficiency of grain, I think they're pretty good at that. And when we're talking about grain, we're not talking about individual kernels. We're talking about ears that are left that the cattle can probably get to pretty well. That still amounts to, five, at, at half a percent of the corn yield, that still amounts to 5.6% of the diet. Notice I carried that to a decimal place. I should have carried it a couple more, so you'd think I was really making a good estimate, right? Uh, but that range, and if, if I'm starting with about a 50% TDN diet based on the digestibilities that I showed for leaves and husks and so on, uh, that would raise it 2.3 percentage units. And for a, for a beef cow, that's very significant, right? That makes a lot of difference. And most likely it has no impact on, uh, on intake because it wouldn't have any bulk with it. Uh, this would be another issue about uh, grazing. Again, data from the 80s where we uh, collected diet samples through the grazing period uh, with esophageally fistulated cows. Uh, that digestibility is high at the beginning, including some corn, no, and they're eating mostly husk. Uh, but, the, but it's all out there the first day, isn't it? And, and this, is, this is an important point, isn't it? They were out there, it was designed to be a 60-day grazing season. Okay, that was the amount of, uh, of forage that we had uh, allotted to the animals. And so it was all out there the first day, so they ate the dessert first, and uh, then they were down to uh, uh, broccoli <laughs> at the end. Uh, so uh, that's an issue. Now, did the requirements of, uh, of, of a cow go down like that over the grazing period? Uh, no, if anything, they're going the other direction, aren't they? With the gestation, the cow is increasing in uh, requirements. Uh, growing calves, they may be staying about the same. And so obviously this uh, leads one to some kind of a rotational scheme where you're adding new material. So you'd have small waves rather than this big decline. Okay, grazing removal uh, at 200 bushel corn at, at assuming eight pounds per bushel that's consumed, okay? I took that 15.3 and rounded that up to 16 and said 50% harvest efficiency, so that gives us 1,600 pounds of leaf and husk uh, consumed, uh, and that, uh, that uh, would be at about uh, 2.4 AUMs per acre. Uh, 
uh, about 7,680 pounds of total residue. So that means that what they were consuming is about 21% of what's out there. You with my, my math so far? Right or wrong, I've made assumptions there, but you, yeah, I hope you're with me there. On the other hand, uh, I, now I've, I'm not being consistent. Instead of 50% digestibility, I was being really conservative and saying, uh, 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 let's say it's 55 uh, digestibility. That means 45% is indigestible that gets deposited back on the field, right? If you figure that organic matter in, then you're down to 11.6% removal. So with grazing at what would be our recommended uh, stalking rate, uh, 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 the net removal is only uh, uh, 11 to 12%. Okay? <clears throat> Should be obvious to all of you here, but there's not a net nutrient removal. Steve did a nice job talking about uh, uh, mineral removal. Well, the cattle aren't, they're not carrying any significant amount of weight, even a growing calf. If we're supplementing with five pounds of distiller's grains, we're doing a nice job of fertilizing with phosphorus, aren't we? And probably nitrogen, we're overfeeding nitrogen. So we're adding nutrients if we're grazing. Our needs then for residues, I'm, 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 I think I'm leaving grazing. Um, uh, for cows for grazing, calf grazing, uh, feedlot cattle, uh, stalks and their silage and dry lot cows would be the uses we're talking about today. Uh, our cattle needs, uh, if all of our, I used uh, two million cows, if all of them grazed, and I think I had them grazing for four months when I made this calculation, uh, that's 1.8 million tons of residue that was needed. Calf grazing is much less. I estimated uh, half a million calves, but I don't know what that number is. I know the statistics say we have about one and a half million outside of feedlots uh, at, in January 1, but I don't know how to adjust that. Uh, but it's, that's gonna be a smaller number anyway. Uh, a feedlot cattle, my assumption here is one as a roughage source now. Casey, it's not treated stocks, okay? It's just as a roughage source, a pound per head per day. Okay, so that's uh, 2.5 million pounds a day, and that adds up to uh, uh, 0.46 million tons uh, a year. Uh, I threw in uh, an additional 500,000 uh, cows in dry lot. Because we don't have any more pasture, if we, include, if we increase our cow herd, it'll have to be a, a dry lot or some kind of a takeoff on that. And, and we've started a dry lot cow project you may be familiar with. Uh, and what are we gonna use there? Well, you're gonna use corn, what feed do we have? We got corn residue and byproducts, right? And that would seem to fit. Uh, so I'd use up another uh, 0.48 million tons with dry lot uh, cows. And so that's, uh, again, I've got that to two decimal places to make it look like I, I know what I'm doing. Uh, so about three million tons. The balance then, uh, irrigated corn would in Nebraska uh, at that 200 bushel yield will give us about 30 uh, million tons of residue. Dry land about another 11.7. Uh, uh, that's a total of about 42 million tons. Interestingly, if you look at that ratio of irrigated to dry land, it's about 30% from dry land and 70% from uh, irrigated, and I've always had that number, people have told me about 70% of our corn is from irrigated acres. Well, I didn't know whether that was 70% of the acres or 70% of the corn. Once I did this calculation, it's clear to me, uh, Don, that it's 70% of the corn is coming from irrigated acres. Uh, not that it's 70% irrigated acres. Okay. Uh, I said a maximum use. Now if we do a lot of treating, if we feed a lot more corn silage, uh, if we did a lot more dry lot cows than a half a million, by the way, I'm not promoting a half a million dry lot cows. 
because we added that many cows in a hurry, the price of calves would go down and everybody would say, well, Klopfenstein said we should have another half a million cows. I'm just saying that's an option, right? I'm not promoting it. My point is that our 2.99 million tons relative to 42 is 7.1% uh, uh, if, if we used all of the corn stalks. If we said, okay, we're going to leave the dry land corn stalks alone, we're still only at 9.9%. Again, this is consistent with what Steve was saying. We can feed all of the cattle and not take off all of that much residue. Now the consequences, uh, subsequent crop yields, soil, and water, I would say, would be the issues. Um, I'm going to introduce a, 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 a concept here. It seemed to us that these consequences were bigger than animal scientists. You with me? And so uh, it was important for us to engage our agronomists and engineers. And I did that on the 24th of uh, May. Got us all together. And uh, we talked. And we've had some uh, uh, email discussions since then. I'm going to share that with you. But to try to talk about, OK, what are the consequences? Because all of us are saying, well, yeah, give us that corn residue and give it to us. What's the favorite word? Free. Cheap. Yeah, yeah. Free. <laughs> That's better than cheap. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. See, I think, I think we should get paid. I'm going to make a case for that. We should get paid for grazing stocks, right? We're adding nutrients. We're doing a tillage. That 12, Steve said, $12 a, uh, an acre per pass. We should be getting, that's, well, we won't go there. <laughs> okay, so we've been on this field. It's a linear move irrigation field over here in the uh, northeast corner of the uh, uh, research center. Um, And this is the layout of the field. Uh, it's a corn soybean rotation. And that's a bit of an issue for us. Uh, Steve showed quite a bit of corn after corn information. Uh, uh, is Schroeder back there? Yeah, so he's pushed us to corn soybean rotation. He thinks that's the way to go. So that's what we're, we're dealing with. And I don't disagree with that uh, much except soy, DJ, those soybean residues aren't all that good, right? We established that. Uh, so that we've got uh, uh, the fall grazed. Uh, fall, it's really winter. We call it fall to separate it from the spring, but it's, it's uh, uh, from, uh, oh, November to uh, February. And then the spring grazed is February to April when we turn out on grass. The spring grazed is actually at a heavier stalking rate trying to simulate the producer that's wanting to calve on a cornfield. That's the way we started out. And, and uh, in, in discussing this with Mark, we said, well, what do we have to do to, to really impact uh, the subsequent crop yield? And so we, we went to a uh, uh, double the stalking rate. Double? Two and a half times the stalking rate. Uh, and so then in the middle of each of these uh, uh, reps on the different sides of the road there, uh, we've got the ungrazed area in the middle. And uh, so we've been following that for about 20 years now. Uh, these are the yields out of that. Uh, so this is removal by grazing, and we graze with calves. I think the removal is because we're, we're, we're using an AUM kind of a basis, so I think our removal is, is consistent with what cows would remove. Uh, so from... Uh, uh, 1996 to 2011 in that corn soybean rotation, soybeans following the year of grazing uh, uh, yielded 60.4 bushels per acre. The grazed yielded 62.4, and that's a statistically significant difference. And Schroeder is yet to pay us for the two bushels per acre of soybeans. <laughs> You know. <laughs> well, and you don't have to till and the whole thing. I, anyway, so much for that. 
Uh, th then we've measured corn yields, and it's so simple now, all we've got to use is the yield monitor on the combine, right? Uh, the corn yield this, the year following soybeans uh, is numerically higher but not statistically different. So the point is we have not decreased yields, and with, with what Steve was talking about, we're getting so much residue now that getting some of it off is really important. So, the, and the, quite frankly, I believe the grazing is a really good way to get that off. Some old dry land data indicated, again, we weren't having an impact, uh, but, but I think we're short on, on dry land data. Uh, uh, four or five years ago, uh, Don Adams out at uh, North Plain, uh, uh felt like maybe the most important, and it was really uh, uh, what great insight as to what was happening out there because of water use issues uh, in that area. Uh, so they bought this uh, land uh, uh, near Brule, and uh, so there's a pivot that they've put into this experiment. And uh, so there's light grazing and, and uh, heavy grazing. It's a, a factor of two, okay, uh, twice as many cows in the uh, heavy grazing. And then there's a no, no removal uh, and, and baling. <clears throat> uh, these are the corn yields uh, on that for the three years. Uh, if you just look at that average down there, uh, that one AUM per acre, which is the light rate, uh, is the same as the uh, uh, control. Uh, two AUMs per acre is numerically actually higher, which you would believe, obviously you need more years. Remember on our linear move field, we got a lot of years and that's what we need on this. Uh, the baling did not decrease uh, subsequent corn yield, and this is corn after corn out there. That's not soybean territory. Uh, so in our discussion, talking about the baling and taking more off, right? I think we can make a compelling argument for grazing. And this is an issue, though. Uh, uh, Denny Bauer has told us that they lost how many thousand acres, did he say? several thousand acres that just because uh, corn farmers did not want to risk hurting their yields, okay? Well, you know, grazing is not, not a problem. Now, taking more off, uh, I would say for most of our agronomists, then starts to become a bit of an issue, and we've got to convince them. I doubt that many of you have, uh, have corn farmers as clients, right? You, you consultants, right? Uh, they've got a crop consultant as a, as a, or the crop consultant's the one that has them as a client. Our uh, USDA people located on campus have been doing research here on the research center. Uh, I take that back. This was probably done, uh, Mark, probably done out on the, uh, what, the farm east of Lincoln, Rogers Farm. I think this was, or, uh, yeah, but that's the irrigated that I'll get to, I think. Uh, and uh, this was uh, uh, described here as a marginal site uh, that would have qualified for CRP. Uh, uh, No-tail, continuous corn, nitrogen rates, uh, removal uh, uh, treatments, removed or uh, retained. And uh, uh, this is the, the yield data. Uh, the amount of residue that they removed was about 50% in the removal part of it. And uh, their, their uh, concluding statement over here is that when they did that, they reduced uh, corn yield by about two bushels per acre by removing 50% of the residue in a dry land or rain fed field. Now, they've worked on the irrigated system up here and uh, continuous corn, uh, and they're using disc tillage or no-till, uh, and 
their, their goal was to remove 0, 50, or 100%, and you'll see that they don't get it removed at quite that rate. So these are the yields. Uh, notice that they were removing about uh, uh, 35 to 40 percent, or uh, about uh, 80 percent, is what they were getting off with the removal when they were targeting the 50 and 100. Um, especially here with no-till, look at the marked improvement when they remove some. Okay, this is the point that Steve was making, right? Just reinforces that 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 there's so much residue out there that you can't get it planted. Uh, 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 the ground is insulated. It doesn't warm up. All of the things that the agronomists talk about. Uh, tillage appeared to, uh, which makes some sense, to uh, account for that. Uh, the point being that uh, they feel very comfortable about taking off that uh, 40%. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay, so now I've got uh, a summary from our meeting that lasted a couple of hours and then some uh, uh, email exchanges. And so kind of where we're at uh, in terms of the animal scientists and the uh, uh, agronomists here uh, on campus. So the corn residue offers an opportunity to maintain and grow the beef cattle industry in Nebraska and compensate for the increase in corn cash, uh, corn cost and reduction in pasture acres. Well, that's what we've been talking about. And then even with increased numbers in use of corn residue, the beef industry would use less than 15% of the state's corn residue. We're not, for the cattle industry at least, we're not talking about that great a usage. Okay, so now when the red appears, <clears throat> Uh, the black is what I've written, and the red is what uh, Charlie Wartman, uh, extension agronomist, added to it. I thought he was very thoughtful in the things that he added, so that's why I, I wanted to include that. His comment was, when I said removal of residue by cattle grazing is less than 15% in most cases, he said, Maybe, but I have the impression that it is more in some cases, and especially in rain-fed situations. The residues appear to be more palatable with lower yields and in variable fields. The most heavily grazed is often where more cover is needed, right? I think that's very thoughtful, right? And so, uh, uh, that CRP land that's gotten plowed up and planted to corn, uh, don't you think there's some risk uh, with even grazing that? Certainly we shouldn't be harvesting off of that. Our experience back in the 80s was that we in fact did get better calf performance on, on dry land fields than on irrigated fields. And that goes with what he's saying is, I think the plants are maybe a little less mature uh, 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 the quality was a little bit better, and so they performed a little bit better. Uh, and it might even suggest that in some, in some uh, rougher areas, the corn may have been uh, stressed more by moisture and so on there, and that's what the cattle eat, and they spend their time eating there instead of a, a higher yielding part of the field. Uh, this is getting to be precision grazing agriculture, isn't it? Uh, uh, but uh, so I thought this is very thoughtful about uh, uh, dry land. Then I said grazing of irrigated corn residue or harvest of 20 to 30 percent of the residue likely increases subsequent crop yields if no-till, that it in fact increases. So instead of putting some kind of a disclaimer on there, and say, no, I don't think you should say that it increases corn yield. He added the comment, probably you could harvest 40 to 50 percent. Not that it's increasing yield 40 to 50 percent. That would be great, wouldn't it? Uh, but we could probably take 40 to 50 off. I'm being a little conservative because I don't think we need to take that much. All right? 
But you can see where he's coming from, and he interacts quite a bit with the, uh, with the USDA people that are doing the research. Tillage is more detrimental to erosion and probably subsequent yields than residue removal up to 20%. And he added again up to 40 to 50%. The consensus of people at that meeting was the engineers and agronomists, everybody. Tillage is more detrimental to erosion than residue removal. Very concerned about how much tillage uh, occurs. Uh, item six, no residue should be removed from highly erodible fields. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> Charlie added, this is fields with highly erodible soil, but with inappropriate management for erosion control. Unfortunately, and I think this is meaningful, Unfortunately, some of the heaviest removal occurs on fields of highly erodible soil with management inappropriate for erosion control. This is a major concern and where stewardship appears to be moving backward. It is my impression that land stewardship is currently worse than it has been during the past three to four decades in some parts of the state. So we don't want to be part of this problem, do we? So I think this is really important that we be careful about what kind of fields that we, uh, uh, that we remove Stover from. Light to moderate grazing of non-irrigated fields of low erodibility is likely without consequence, and I got no comment to that. Residue harvest should be done primarily on irrigated fields. And Charlie added, yes, but even rain-fed fields in higher rainfall eastern Nebraska where conditions and management prevent erosion. So he was being more liberal than what I was on harvest. And I said uh, pre-harvest should be limited to 20 to 30 percent. He adds that management uh, uh, of this level is problematic and need I'm sorry, uh, somebody typed this wrong. That shouldn't be read yet. I, I wrote this statement that I thought management of this level of removal is problematic and needs further research. That second sentence. And that's, isn't that a lot what Steve was saying? It's problematic from how we harvest, how much we take off of a given acre, and how many years in a row we take that off. Uh, so I think it's problematic, but it's a great opportunity for us, isn't it? Okay, so Charlie added, the acceptable removal depends on the amount produced. We do not have good guidelines in regards to effect on yield. There may now be sufficient data available. He goes on, and uh, he uh, talks about the same rule, the, the Russell uh, equation and so on that's used for uh, estimating erosion. And uh, they've got a NEB guide. I think I'm going to comment on that. Maybe not, so I'll go back to it. Uh, that NEB guide is under revision, and uh, uh, that'll be out. I will comment on that. Husk, this was an interesting one. Husk and cob removal is of, uh, is of little consequence, especially on irrigated acres. Uh, it, as far as the engineers and agronomists are concerned, you can have all the cobs and husks you want. That's kind of, at least the husk would be nice to get off there. And uh, anyway, Casey, I'll challenge you one of these days about harvesting cobs. And a lot of you know how I feel about corn cobs. Uh, silage harvest should be accompanied with heavy manure application and or cover crops. Uh, sowing of uh, cover crops immediately after harvest needs to be strongly promoted for the ground cover and soil protection, but also for grazing or hay, at least for irrigated land. Steve spoke to that, showed a nice picture of the cover crop. And I think this is absolutely critical in silage harvest. Okay. Uh, residue harvest, uh, uh, that's open as far as I'm concerned. And then this NEB guide covers uh, uh, removal. It's being uh, redone. It's got good stuff and it. it's got uh, nutrient removal. Uh, costs, those kinds of things that Steve covered a lot of that. And this is under uh, revision. Um, and my last comment is titled hypothetical. 
And in that NEB guide, and in a lot of comments made by agronomists on them now for a reason, they say, well, if you lose two to three bushels, so what does that imply to you as soon as they say, if you lose two to three bushels? At $6 a bushel, that's $12 to $18 an acre, right? What's the, what's the going rate for, per acre for uh, stock grazing? $12 to $18 an acre, right? So in, in the mind of the corn producer, if I'm going to lose 2 to $3, I'm, if I'm going to use, let me back up, try to start this over again. Uh, if I'm going to lose 2 to $3 bushels, and it's going to cost me 12 to $18, and that's all I'm going to get for grazing, why would I, let, why would I risk it, right? You understand the concept? My point is, hypothetical just doesn't cut it, right? Because what do our data show? We show that we're increasing yields by grazing. So don't say hypothetically if. You see what I mean? Because as soon as you say that, the corn producer said, oh, I'm going to lose two to three bushels. It's in the NEB guide. One of their worksheets shows it in the NEB guide. If you lose it, this is what it's going to cost you, right? So I'm, I'm on my soapbox here, all right? Don't say hypothetically, you know, if you don't have the data to support it, so there. <laughs>